network. So we are right up there punching with some of the big chambers and for that we're very, very grateful. But it also, of course, gives us the opportunity to get information and to get uh, a feeling for what is actually happening out there in the uh, business community. And with that in mind, uh, I know myself, I have quoted this report already uh, since I saw the results and I've used it as part of something that we were trying to achieve. Other people have actually been able to engage with us and we've been able to lobby with them on their behalf with all sorts of subjects such as international trade, COVID costs, you name it, we've been able to do it. So that's why this is such an important report. Uh, I'd like to take this opportunity to, to thank our sponsor, to thank the Worcestershire Local Enterprise, uh, Enterprise Partnership for their very generous sponsorship. And of course, to today's speaker, Judy Chadwick, who you'll hear from later, their support and their insight is valuable to everything that we do. And this, this survey is no different to that. But I'd also like to take the opportunity. And as I uh, quickly look around the screen, I think we're certainly represented by a couple of people who actually helped us to create this survey and helped us with some of the questions and how perhaps the questions would help us uh, understand some of the results. So thank you to those people as well. Of course, this report and this gathering this afternoon, it wouldn't happen at all if we didn't have the support of our fantastic chamber team. And so it gives me, uh, I always love this opportunity because it gives us just a chance to celebrate the fact that uh, Lisa and Arjun, you've done a man magnificent job getting this together and getting us here this afternoon. So thank you for that. And thank you for your continued efforts with the report. And um, we are gonna have an opportunity to uh, take some questions. Uh, how you ask those questions is, is entirely up to you. Feel free to use the chat box, uh, as many of us are now quite accustomed to uh, on, on these Zoom calls. Uh, alternatively, we could do the old fashioned putting a hand up and using the button on the or Zoom to do that, and I will monitor that as we go through. Uh, but we're going to hear from Arjun and then we're going to hear from Judy. So first of all, I'm going to hand over to Arjun. And um, while he loads his slides there, there'll just be a slight pause and then he'll crack on. So thank you, everybody. And over to you, Arjun. Hi, thanks, everyone, uh, for attending today's session. Um, can you just give me a final result if you can see that presentation? Yep, thank you. So, yeah, as we said today, obviously, this is a quarterly economic survey, the first one for the year. Um, so. So just a bit of information about the report itself. Um, it's actually been running now for the last 31 years. Um, the data collection actually took place between the Monday 15th of February and the Monday the 8th of March, so a three week time period. In total, this quarter, 464 businesses filled out the survey. Um, like Robert said, we were the third most successful chamber this quarter um, in achieving that target. And the top five sectors which filled out the survey were professional services, uh, manufacture of other goods, retailing um, slash wholesaling, consumer services, um, public and voluntary sector services. Now, as we move on throughout the report, um, we find obviously the executive summary and the key findings that we found. Um, as you can see, some of the key stats within the report found that cash flow remains negative for fourth quarter in a row is decreasing slightly from minus 5% to minus 8%. Um, this could be obviously due to withdrawal of some government support, uh, i.e. in terms of grants and loans um, throughout as we're moving now throughout the government roadmap. However, 30% of businesses are looking to recruit for the next three months, which is a key indicator of where we are heading towards the roadmap and ideally seeing growth within the UK and the wider economy. So, as we said, obviously in support with, with the LEP, um, we also focus on automation and skills within this report. Um, all the data in this section is based on 345 Worcestershire businesses who responded to the quarterly economic indicator. Um, the split was mainly 67% service companies and 33% manufacturers, um, which is, just gives a true indicator of the type of companies that are kind of represented within the survey. Um, it is striking to see that almost a third of businesses did not think automation was relevant to their business. Um, this could be a range of factors, um, understanding about the lack of, understand, uh, lack of understanding about automation and how it has the potential to benefit a range of sectors, i.e. like manufacturing, professional services and engineering. 
when we've drilled further into the data, we find a clear trend um, how micro and small businesses like your local SMEs were much less li likely to be considering automation. While we can only speculate on this, um, there may be some additional factors to this, i.e. because of costs, uh, resources associated to introduce an automation, and uh, maybe more significant barriers for smaller businesses rather than the larger corporations. Um, moving on to skills, the percentage of businesses planning to increase automation also varies considerably by sector. Um, the three sectors most likely to increase automation in the next couple of years to five years are manufacturers of electronic goods, manufacturers of non-electronic goods and retail. On the other hand, the three sectors unlikely to be increasing automation are construction, transport and distribution and cultural and creative. And some of the benefits, i.e. the top two benefits, which you can see in the graph on the right hand side, and um, the businesses hope to, achieve, hope to achieve by introducing automation are increased efficiency and productivity. As we move on, there are kind of questions that have been asked about how do we access funding for automation and where can we get government support? Here we've identified a couple of grants that are, um, for automation and looking to help increase the technological productivity within companies. Um, one of the grants that a lot of SMEs might know within the cost of counties are the Sustain and Grow grants, up to £25,000 capital and revenue grant support, 50% match funded to Worcestershire SMEs, includes business adjustments, business change and transformation projects to accommodate new working practices and production of new technology. However, that is limited to only a selective few industries, i.e. manufacturing, IT and professional services. The Here to Help Business Grant um, on the top right of your screen is a £3 million programme to help Worcestershire businesses throughout the pandemic. Um, there is also a Help to Grow Digital Scheme announced in the March budget by uh, Rishi Sunak. Small businesses are about to get free partial advice on how technology can help boost their performance for a new online platform. Eligible businesses will also be able to get a discount of up to 50% on cost on approved software worth up to £5,000 that helps businesses towards building customer relationships and increase sales and make the most of selling online and manage your accounts and finances digitally. Also, there is a new scheme called Made Smarter, um, which is now being piloted in the Northwest. It's not yet available in the Midlands at this moment in time. However, the idea behind the project is to help manufacturers implement a more technology and implement and identify the skills needed, i.e. trying to talk to colleges and universities about kind of getting the skills needed for automation within these businesses, and talking to businesses and identifying the needs um, and help bridge the gap together. As we move on into the report, we are more focusing on obviously the UK market and the overseas market. Uh, the UK market has seen low levels of orders and sales for a fourth quarter in a row. Data from the quarterly economic indicator shows that 29% of businesses saw an increased sales during this quarter. That could be due to the government roadmap, i.e. in terms of non-essential shops opening on April the 12th. Um, and as we move out throughout the roadmap, hopefully lockdown ends on the 17th of June for all of us to enjoy. Um, businesses did see Increase in sales this quarter, while 35% saw their sales to decrease and 37% advised no change at all. The latest figures released by the Office of National Statistics that we also compare our report to saw GDP grow by 1.2% in December 2020. This, like I said, was during December when there was a month of these restrictions. Um, as we did enter a new lockdown for four months, and starting in January. Um, so the data collection does represent kind of the businesses and where they're heading. Um, the recovery for the UK market is very much dependent on the success of easing lockdown restrictions within the UK and following the government, the government roadmap to achieving this. As you look more abroad in terms of the global picture, uh, the overseas market, our, you know, the data shows that 17% of businesses have reported an increase in overseas sales while 37% reported a decrease and 37% stated no change. As you can, you know, all the way, whilst, whilst the Chamber did speak to SMEs and large corporations across the counties, we have identified that there are additional kind of paperwork challenges when trading with the EU and the rules of origin. 
um, i.e. there's been issues with, with supply chains um, and we've kind of lobbied extensively to the local MPs and the British Chamber of Commerce to kind of take up this kind of approach and kind of smooth out some of the issues that businesses that we are talking to to highlight some of the issues that are present. The government has pledged, however, to help small businesses deal with some of these challenges and that is come to be with this um, SME budget support fund which allows businesses to apply for grants of up to £2,000 to help them adapt to new custom and tax rules when trading with the EU. I do suggest that you do try and get applications in quite early for this scheme. And it is a good scheme in terms of corporations to get involved with and kind of find out any significant issues moving forward. As we move on within the presentation, um, cash flow. Um, data from the economic indicator shows that 27% of businesses experience an increase in cash flow this quarter, while 38% remain the same and 35% saw a decrease. Um, the results in, comparing, in comparison to the National Statistics uh, Coronavirus Survey showed that a percentage of businesses within three months cash reserves um, has remained stable from January 2021 to early March at 31%. This is largely due to state intervention, i.e. government support loans and grants um, on offer. And also with the job retention scheme um, due to end in October, um, also that has played a major part in a lot of companies still having relatively low cash flow, um, but it is a deepening kind of worry at the moment for many businesses um, as, we, that, as we move throughout the government roadmap, that ease will kind of ease up. And as we move on into the investment, so 24% of businesses have increased their investment plans this quarter, while 49% remain unchanged. 20% of firms have revised their investment plans down due to uncertainty around Brexit and COVID. This quarterly economic survey shows that a lot of firms right now are not kind of particularly investing at the moment due to uncertainty in the overseas and the UK market. And also COVID has played a significant downplay in terms of investment in infrastructure and growth for many companies. We hope as the um, government roadmap kind of moves forward and lockdown officially ends in June, that we will start to see consumer spending increase in the local, regional and national economy, which will likely boost the UK economy and likely see growth towards the end of this uh, end of the year. Many firms are reluctant to invest during uncertain times. Um, however, as I said, easing restrictions will see firms starting to plan for the reopening of the UK economy. Um, also, on another point on investment that the Chancellor announced on the 3rd of March was in a recent budget, the government announced a super deduction tax. So from the 1st of April 2021 until the 31st of March 2023, allows companies to invest, um, allows companies to claim 130% super deduction capital allowance on qualifying plant and machinery investments. The super deduction will allow companies to cut their tax bill by up to 25p for every pound they invest. Employment and recruitment, 82% um, of businesses within Hereford and Worcester attempted to recruit this quarter. Um, that's quite a big jump considering in the previous quarter, uh, which we hopefully will continue as we ease lockdown. As we said, pay one employees has fallen by 726,000. That's nearly a million people that have lost um, their employment obviously since the pandemic first started. And the focus across both counties is to kind of get that number, you know, low, lower. Um, and help unemployment in terms of youth unemployment. And that's where the bridge in terms of the skills for automation comes in to help kind of bridge that gap moving forward. Um, and speaking to the universities and the colleges and businesses and identifying the gaps needed within their sector um, and help bridge that gap moving forward. Like I said, one of the government schemes that was initially announced during COVID was a kickstart scheme. Um, the Chamber is a gateway provider for the scheme and we've so far seen 275 placements confirmed. Um, this level of support is vital for a number of reasons in terms of making sure that unemployment across both counties remains low um, and helping making sure that we can try and fill the skill shortages within those industries such as manufacturing, engineering, IT, professional services. And as we move on into the business confidence, um, business confidence has improved among businesses across both counties with 59% confident the yearly turnover will increase. 
This is partly down to the level of um, the government roadmap, i.e. in terms of a lot of firms would like to see the yearly turnover increase kind of in the summer months as the economy is set to be released. Um, however, 15% of businesses expect the yearly turnover to decrease, also trying to play catch up with the previous year um, with the loss of you know, making redundancies to employ employees and also trying to recover profits lost from the last year. However, according to the Office of National Statistics, 50% of businesses who have not currently stopped trading had no or low confidence that their business would survive the next three months. This was partly due to a survey back in January when the uh, lockdown was initiated, with many firms stating that they would not survive the next six months if their firms had remained shut. But as we have seen with the success of the vaccination program, and we are slowly now seeing the roadmap dates being achieved and hopefully starting to see the UK economy uh, bounce back to the growth. And that is the end. And I will now hand back to Robert. Thank you, Arjun. Thank you very much for running us through that. And obviously, an enormous amount of information that, uh, as I said earlier, that you have provided because you have actually completed the survey, and uh, we, and as a result, there was, we've been able to create this uh, this report. But uh, there are clear challenges, aren't there? Um, and uh, while the, uh, the the various stages of the roadmap might uh, create some optimism, I think that is uh, careful optimism, uh, considered optimism as we go from uh, each stage to the next and uh, uh, and work accordingly with that. Now, as a Chamber of Commerce, of course, it's, um, it's uh, easy for us to uh, identify that this is the situation and uh, to uh, appreciate where we are and where everybody's businesses and organisations are. But it's then it's then our responsibility as a chamber of commerce to to support you, uh, the members, and to support the the wider business community and the various other organisations. And um, while supporting you, perhaps connecting you with people who can uh, who can help, and uh, people who can uh, work through some of the issues that you might be encountering. So. You would have seen the slide there with regards to uh, the number of different uh, financial grant uh, opportunities that they are. And in recent times, uh, myself and colleagues have been involved in uh, trying to um, signpost people towards uh, perhaps assistance that they might be able to, uh, to receive. And we will welcome the opportunity to do that as well. Uh, the other area, of course, which was mentioned quite extensively there and equally is hugely important to both of our counties is that of international trade. And uh, obviously the Chamber of Commerce, we have a fantastic team who are able to support you uh, with that particular activity, as we do a number of uh, members who uh, have uh, professional departments that can help uh, with various issues that might be encountered. So that's where the support and that's where the connections come in and that's why we can act as that intermediary and help people in that regard. So Arjun, thank you for that. That really was a very extensive uh, run through and I think everybody will have uh, perhaps seen something there or learned something there for the first time or actually been able to take something away and uh, see if that actually applies to, to their business as well as perhaps some of the other respondents. So I talk about uh, support and I talk about connecting people and that brings me uh, quite seamlessly on to the work that we do with the uh, Local Enterprise Partnership and particularly with Judy. Uh, I'm lucky enough to sit on the skills board as a number of people are in Worcestershire. In fact, I'm lucky enough to do that in Herefordshire as well. And um, so that gives me the opportunity to, to hand you over to Judy now, who's going to talk you through some of the, um, uh, the results of the report, but also some of the wider uh, issues in and around the, the skills picture. And then we'll be open, opening up to uh, questions and uh, that can be about anything that we've discussed so far today. So Judy, over to you. Hello, um, good afternoon, everybody. Um, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Judy Chadwick and I'm the Director of Skills at the Worcestershire Local Enterprise Partnership. I also work within the County Council as well and um, help to support that connectivity between the two organisations around skills and employment. Um, thank you, Rob, uh, for the introduction, and thank you, Arjun and Lisa, for the work that you've done on the QES. I'm always appreciated, as you know. 
I'm sure that you all know, and obviously I'm sure that Gary is in one of these little boxes if I whiz along my screen, but um, the Local Enterprise Partnership, our role in terms of skills and people is to look at what our needs are as a county now and in the future, um, and how we support our businesses to remain productive over, um, over the next few years and ensure that our young people coming out and our individuals coming into employment or who are in employment have the skills that you need to remain uh, productive. For us, um, you know, we all know in the UK there's a shortage of digital skills. I mean, you only have to look at the Chamber's last survey they did in the autumn around employment. And I think the statistic, and Arjun, I'm sure you'll correct me, was something along the lines of that 30% of the employers in that survey cited digital skills as the biggest challenge in terms of recruitment. Um, so you can see it's affecting our employers now and it's been talked about nationally. Um, it's digital skills for me as something that obviously runs across all businesses. It runs across all sectors. I think when people think about it, they very much think about the size of the digital sector or the IT sector, but actually every business has a, has a role or has a need for um, ICT skills of some kind. Um, for me, why did I ask the team to look at this? It was predominantly because the um, Local Enterprise Partnership at the time was writing its um, local skills report. I've just put the link into the chat for that because it has been published. But the local skills report basically is our plan, our priorities moving forward. Um, Automation is talked about in that, but we realised that we really didn't have enough weight to that argument or to that section within the uh, within the document and we wanted to look at it a little bit further in the context of Worcestershire. Um, I think alongside that you know there are a number of other factors that other than the obvious skill shortage that we already know about that kind of um, impact on why we're so concerned about the impact of automation. One of which, um, obviously, the one we're all very much aware of and we all know about and we're all bored of talking about, which is COVID. So the impact of COVID, um, you know, it's rapidly increased the evolution of technological solutions and therefore the need for our employees to have the skills around digital um, and the growth of differing need of skill set as well in different businesses. The second sort of rationale would be that, um, and I've talked about this so many times, so a number of you will have heard me say it, the fact that in our workforce, one in three people in the Worcestershire workforce is over 50. It's nationally replicated. Worcestershire was a little bit ahead of the curve. We hit that dynamic in uh, demographic in 2019. Um, I think, I believe the UK is just hitting that now. Um, so we are a little bit uh, ahead of that curve. And that's more predominant in certain industries. Um, Lisa and I have been looking at this um, aging workforce piece in Worcestershire for some time. Um, and certainly we know that in engineering manufacturing sector, that figures more like one in two. Um, and obviously that brings with it some concerns in terms of automation. Um, you know, it's a little bit of a sweeping statement, but it's fair to say that quite often it's our older workforce that requires more support to get up to speed with the, with the digital piece. Um, so obviously that's a concern, but also in terms of the sort of creative media skills, um, again, that's not naturally something that um, older people are doing all the time, whereas we know that our young people are uh, social media and a social media frenzy using all the various platforms. Um, and I suppose that the third thing for me is that we need to make sure if we have this need in our workforce, that our young people are demanding that from our education sector. Um, you know, we very much think about in skills and in education, how the supply meets the demand. So how does education meet the demand of you, the employers? How do we make sure that young people coming out have the skills you need? But there's one part of that which, which is easy to overlook, which is how do we ensure that young people want to be educated in the subjects that we as employers need? And there's a role for us all to play there. And then the fourth thing is that the government recently published a slight change to its strategy around skills. And um, it's been coming for a long time, which basically says that um, they would like employers to be at the heart of all education. So to be um, 
the education to be very much focused around the needs of employers. So when kind of coming into this with Lisa and Arjun, it was a case of um, wanting to understand the need more around what digital skills do we need, what automation do we need, and how do we influence our education provision to be able to supply that. And for me, the QES was kind of the first step in that. Um, it's almost like a test, really. We use the, we, um, with the aging workforce piece, we, we've asked the question a number of times. And the reason is because actually what we find often is that this is like the seed and it grows in people's mind and then they actually realize the level of automation within their business or the need for automation within their business and it's likely that if we ask this question again in six months the answers would be slightly higher we would we would envisage in terms of um just testing you know in worcestershire what um whether we think there is this demand we had a, a quick look this week at some of our programs to have a look at kind of what was going through it. I know Rob mentioned Kickstart, um, both the Chamber and the County Council are Kickstart Gateways. I had a look at the County Council's Kickstart Gateway yesterday to have a look at how many of those were vacancies that had some kind of relationship to either a technical or creative ICT type role. Um, and um, it was 18% of all the vacancies that are listed, which is quite a considerable amount, really. Um, I don't know if Rob had a chance to have a look at the um, chamber ones, but um, certainly in our last sort of combined view, it was a fairly significant figure of um, businesses asking young people to look at uh, creative technical ICT type vacancies for them. We, I also had a look at the Worcestershire Jobs site, so I ran a bit of a search on Worcestershire Jobs. If you don't know, Worcestershire Jobs was launched by the LEP and the Council at the beginning of April to support residents to be able to more, um, what's the right word, to be able to search in a more efficient manner for a job. Um, it, Worcestershire Jobs brings together all of the online job search uh, platforms into one place and returns results specifically for Worcestershire, but also within a certain mileage of Worcestershire. So it's quite a, it's a good platform to get a sense of what the, um, what the skills needs are within the county. Um, and yesterday when I ran that again, we were looking at well over a hundred. It's quite difficult to, um, to figure out the exact numbers, but well over 100 uh, vacancies were coming up that had some sort of ICT relationship to them. Um, I was uh, particularly surprised, um, although perhaps not so, around the number looking at data. Um, so the role of data and the data that comes out of the um, ICT platforms and analysing that data. So as I say, we use the QES very much to kind of test this um, and um, yeah, and be able to see kind of where we are um, in terms of automation. So we may well be asking these questions for some time to come. Um, I know Arjun kind of touched on what was interesting in there. And for me, the most interesting thing and the most um, certainly useful thing is um, the stats around what skills you as businesses are looking for. Um, and actually, there was quite a lot in there around digital marketing, quite a lot in there around cybersecurity, um, but also a lot around the sort of the skills that aren't specifically IT, but relate into that. Um, so there's a bit about project management and administration as well within that. And these are, this data is really, really interesting. And for us to be able to give this data in its current form to our education providers will allow them to kind of set their training store, set their provision out for the next year. Um, it's very much not not finished um, for me and um, we need to continue to be able to dig down into that uh, into that digital marketing to uh, see what that might mean and what actually you as employers are looking for but uh, it certainly does give us a good starting point. So in terms of um, for me kind of what I would ask of you I suppose as businesses moving forward I mean um, you know I'd love for you to read my um, local skills report there will be a summarized version coming out if you want to wait for the shortened version um, but you know if you wish to read that one then that would be great and you'll be able to see where we and all of our partners um, are kind of looking to focus um, and I suppose what I would also ask is that you, you within your own workforce, you very much do have a look at what that sort of future need is going to be. We know that a lot of our employers in Worcestershire don't spend huge amounts of time looking forward at their workforce needs, and it very much can creep up on them. And then they're sort of surprised by the fact that they've got this skills gap and this skills need. 
um, we are uh, launching a product tomorrow, actually, which um, hopefully might help around the workforce planning piece. And um, uh, I know Ben's on this call and um, Ben's been, Ben Mannion's been instrumental in supporting us to bring that product forward. Um, and it's to support older over 50s in the workforce to kind of look at their careers and, and skills needs moving forward um, and to help you as employers to be able to understand what they might need. Um, I would also encourage you to get involved in some of the schemes. So um, the Kickstart scheme that's run by the Chamber, that's run by the County Council. You know, we, we all know that at the moment we've got a lot of young people who are out of work. How can you as businesses utilise, harness that, uh, that, that young talent and uh, bring them into your businesses to give them a flavour of your business for a period of time? Um, I'm sure, sure they won't mind me saying that, you know, there's no cost to the Kickstart scheme. And um, I know certainly Sharon and myself will be more than happy to receive any more referrals onto, onto the programme. Uh, but also to look at things like apprenticeships. So, you know, using apprenticeships as a way to grow staff into your businesses and um, to look at uh, traineeships, which is a, a lower level than apprenticeships, but it's more like a work experience placement for a young person. In Worcestershire, we're also um, lucky in that two of our colleges will be launching digital technical levels in um, September. So this means that in, in over the next two years, we will have young people coming out with the equivalent of three A levels who are very much focused around digital. And um, the advantage of technical levels is that they have a huge element of work experience. So it's somewhere between a vocational course and an apprenticeships kind of in the middle. Um, but it means that they will have very much more um, idea of what it is that employers are looking for, um, but with that educational piece as well when they come out at 18 years of age. And then my final ask, I suppose, would be to collaborate. So we only know what we know from doing the processes of the, of the quarterly economic summary and kind of consulting with you as employers. And that is so important moving forward. We need to understand what your needs are in order to be able to support you to fill them. Um, and that that you know that might be simply having a conversation with us about those needs, um, linking into the growth hub, into Worcestershire Business Central to kind of have conversations about moving forward and and how Business Central and the team there can support. Um, but that all of that information kind of gets linked back into the skills piece. Um, but also working with our colleges, working with our schools help them influence the curriculum and understand what is important to you as employers. Um, that's probably all for me, but um, thank you very much for your time today. I um, really appreciate the um, work that you know, or you, your responses into the QES in order to help us sort of formulate the starting point of our digital strategy for Worcestershire moving forward. Thank you, Rob. Judy, thank you very much indeed for that. Um, it is a it, an extremely um, complicated picture and there's so many different strands to it, but you do make it sound, and it's very easy to understand. It's very easy to understand perhaps where we sit in that picture of how we can help. And I think as somebody who used to be uh, on the side of being one of those companies that went to my local skills board and said, how can I help? Uh, it is remarkable how uh, a, a small bit of effort can make a huge difference uh, with some, particularly some of our young people. But one of the, one of the things that you've highlighted is actually this is a, a, across uh, a number of age groups and it's also across a number of different industries. Um, I would be very interested to know uh, if there are any general questions about what we've heard this afternoon, if there is perhaps uh, any questions with regards to how in your, or maybe some comment, uh, how your businesses have actually started planning uh, for uh, future skills, uh, because a lot of these sessions are sometimes all about learning from uh, best practice and uh, how somebody else is perhaps making a difference and how that can be replicated. Um, and equally, if there's uh, anything that you might have heard this afternoon that you would like to perhaps be um, put in touch with somebody uh, to give them some more information or even to get that information right here and uh, to see what's uh, going on there. So uh, opening the floor, I'm keeping my eyes peeled for any uh, either virtual hands or normal hands going up. Um, I have a feeling that Jim might be typing a question at the moment. 
And I, it's like it's like uh, watching the telly printer on the old days on ITV Sport, watching the football results come in. Um, so, I, can I see can I see any questions coming in there? One thing I would ask you, Judy, is um, you mentioned with regards to uh, being able to help with some of the schools and the uh, enterprise. Uh, partnership and the uh, careers and enterprise partnership they are doing a lot of work with those schools and it is relatively easy to try and engage with the schools via an advisor isn't it yeah it is really easy and in fact actually um being an advisor it, it, um so the idea the idea behind being an enterprise coordinator with the school is and um, we allocate in Worcestershire more than one business person to a school so you're not handling the whole agenda alone um, but the idea is that you as a business person have a lot of useful information and networks that can be opened up to a school to help their young people understand future careers. Um, so it's, um, you know, it's a really easy piece of work to do. It's a commitment of being an enterprise advisor of about one day a month. Um, but if you aren't able to commit to kind of one day a month, even kind of being involved in some of our um in some other way and um, that might be supporting a school to know about your industry through doing an assembly that might be working with us to put together some resources on um, your your industry and your role there are lots of different ways that you can be involved in terms of supporting education that don't have to be as time consuming as as one day a month absolutely and i think um video Video is becoming one of the ways in which that can certainly be engaged as well. And uh, uh, I personally, I saw a video this morning, which I think any young person watching that video would have been inspired in to try and uh, to go into uh, engineering in that particular business there. A um, couple of questions that have come in. And um, while, uh, while we may not know the exact answers, we may well be able to come. So one of them was from John, John Hesseltine. Thanks for that, John. It's um, obviously there, there is a lot of information to get get our heads around um, but we have a big challenge ahead uh, there's 752,000 permanent jobs have been lost will the 57 percent of businesses confident increasing turnover make a dent in those numbers especially as the jobs advertised are nowhere near that number I don't know whether that's um, Arjun I mean it's uh, putting you on the spot there slightly but um, is there a way is there a way of us uh, through, through our responses um, being able to find perhaps a correlation between those businesses that were confident and whether they are in the industries that will be looking for new employees? Yeah, you know, as, as you said before, you know, we've spent the whole last year kind of lobbying in terms of the government to provide, you know, support in terms of the job retention scheme. And um, what we must not forget is that that scheme has, you know, kind of supported over 11 million jobs over the past year alone. Um, one of the big things that we're kind of in conversation with at the moment, with especially MPs and also lobbying with the main British Chamber of Commerce, is kind of looking at a forward plan um, in terms of, you know, how can businesses best support the job market as you move forward. Now, they've estimated that kind of consumer um, saving over the last year has amounted to somewhere in the region of 280 billion. Um, we are, the government is hoping to some extent that some of that consumer, spe uh, consumer saving turns into consumer spending um, to help boost the local or regional and national economy, um, which in theory will obviously make firms obviously a lot of money and a lot of growth over the next kind of couple of years as we look to bounce back from the economic shock, obviously due to COVID and, and some part Brexit. Um, but I personally believe that as we move forward, um, that if there is a considerable amount of consumer spending, that in theory will likely see firms then reinvest in people as they see a growth in demand for their products. Um, and they will kind of lead to a supply for companies to kind of supply, obviously, a lot of people with jobs um, moving forward. So in essence, the short answer is yes. Um, it will make a change and it will make a um, change in some capacity. It will take a couple of years for that kind of figures to kind of get back up to pre-COVID levels. Thank you, Arjun. Thank you for that. Um, relative, slightly uh, related, I think, because it's kind of matching 
it's matching shortages in a certain part of an instrument. Uh, Alison's asking, oops, oh, just let me, where's that gone? Just as that new question came in, the auto queue went down, look at that. How many businesses have experienced skill shortages in exporting, in particular customs declarations and additional compliance post EU? I guess the, the short answer to that was that we, we know how many exporters and importers have replied to the survey. Um, so we can, uh, we can certainly in some situations drill down on those businesses who have uh, expressed that they are doing ex import export and ask them what the um, uh, what what the relationship is between the shortage of skills. I guess also to answer to reflect that back to what Judy was saying earlier is that import export is going to continue and it's going to continue to have challenges. And so that's a prime example of where perhaps our schools and colleges and our professional bodies, like the Chamber of Commerce, uh, are able to offer. Uh, training to get people up to skill on that particular area. But Alison, we'll take that one away and see if there's anything else that we can uh, work on with that one there. Uh, Ken, thank you very much for that one. Uh, Lord Baker said that uh, we should scrap GCSEs. Um, I only wish he had done that 35 years ago when I was doing my O-levels. How would business people react to recruiting pupils who do not have objective assessment of their abilities, such as exams? Now, I certainly can't answer that. Um, I don't know whether Judy might have a feeling with regards to how important those GCSEs are to actually assessing a young person's abilities or if there's an employer in the room that would like to be able to comment on that. I think it's a benchmark, isn't it, ultimately? So you need some form of benchmark and I suppose that's what GCSEs are whether they should be assessed in the current way, um, not sure. Um, is there an alter, there's always an alternative, of course. Um, I mean, you know, we would talk about those young people that don't achieve GCSEs, and we would probably say that GCSEs weren't necessarily a fair reflection of their abilities, just because they weren't academic. Um, but I, I think, I think it's a bit of a double-edged sword, isn't it? You need a, some kind of benchmark, I think, yeah, it's a you know no one asked me what GCSEs I got now and um, they're not they're not something that I don't think employers look at at this point in my career but I think in terms of moving into the early phases it is that benchmark um, that generally I imagine employers will will look at um, not always but certainly in in the main. Thank you Judy there's some um, very interesting comments there in the chat with regards to uh, uh, whether or not those exam results, they might be the benchmark, but actually it's attitude and it's personality and it's the ability um, that uh, is being measured also. Uh, Matthias, with a uh, question and a comment there. So with confidence growing and no, forecasting to be better than the last 12 months, uh, the big question is uh, when might we return to 2019 figures, i.e. perhaps success that we had in 2019. Can I, can I just comment to the GC? Yeah, absolutely. Thing? Thanks, Martin. I think we all get a bit hung up on the exams. Um, and I think getting GCSEs and exams are fee for me two totally different things. I mean, I'm coming from Germany, a bit of a different background. The education and valuation system in Germany is a bit different. You have got a final exam, for example, for your A-levels, but with the final exam, you will not be able to pull it completely off, meaning fantastic, great, and the biggest whatsoever, but you will also have not a complete downfall. There's always a mixture of grades over the years, of assessments over the teacher over the years. So therefore, you know, yeah, you can fail in the last exam, you lose points, but at the end of the day, what you're looking for is you had a structured education where the structured assessment, and it's not so much based on points because I think someone has said, look, once you've got your grades, you will never open it. Yeah, because everybody thinks you had a structured education and school notes at the end of the day is not what you hire. You hire abilities, you hire the approach, the attitude, and that's for me not really given in notes and, and grades. That's what you see in the interview, but it's kind of the basis 
which you just take for granted. But I have to say, I'm a strong kind of person disagreeing that we push our children into one exam where we tell them, look, if you fail or if you are good in this exam, this will determine your life. I absolutely object to that and I don't like that. So I think there's maybe, maybe even a chance to, to get a bit to a, how should I say it, more balanced assessment to come to a GCSE and not only putting everything into this wild re revising and uh, just being totally reliant on the performance on one day in an exam. Life is never like this, that you determine on one day if you're good or not. That's my personal opinion. No, thank you, Matthias. It's, and it's a valuable one. And um, I think it just it just proves, doesn't it, that um, we we all have a responsibility, as Judy said uh, in an early part of this afternoon, that business has a responsibility to try and help education or the educators to create the subject matter and the learning experiences that we're going to need in, in the future. And uh, whether that is exam based or whether that is experience based or whether that is uh, apprenticeship stroke on the job training, it's, there's so many different ways to prepare young people to, uh, to, to do the roles that we might be looking there for them. Um, Matthias, while I've got you, yeah, if in terms of 2019 versus 2021-22, do you, do, what do you feel? Do you feel that 2022, we may see ourselves coming back towards where we were back in 2019? It's hard to say, but I think this is a bit, a bit misleading at the moment. When you come from a big drop in 2020, how should I say it? A business which doesn't see a brighter view right now would be probably closed by now. So, but the question is really for me to maintain, and this especially in relationship to the employed people, how quick can we think we come back to a decent level which we had be before COVID? Um, I have to say we are doing very well at the moment and business has picked up really. But I know obviously customers and, and business colleagues have said, yeah, it's, it's gone up a bit, but it's not where it should be yet. And then you come to the situation from, from, a, from an employment point of view, if your business levels within the next six months are not picking up, up to let's say 85, 90% where you have been before COVID, then you probably additionally look again at restructuring because yes, COVID and see, um, the, the furlough scheme, scheme helped you over the time, but then if your business doesn't pick up quick enough, then you are in catch 22 again. And I think that would be, sorry, hindsight is a nice thing, but the one thing is seeing an improvement. The other thing is, and I mean, I know this, especially from the aerospace sector, because that's a sector is very hard hit. They can see only their uh, levels return in 22, 23 at least. And, and obviously if you've got that long-term problem that especially in manufacturing, you haven't got the utilization you have no other chance, you need to look at restructuring. And, and I think that would be obviously quite interesting to see from a wider broad of, of, of businesses, because with the drop which we have, yes, clearly we will see a good improvement, but what is a good improvement at the moment? Yeah. No, it's very true. And I think uh, I was slightly amused when I, I uh, on the news I was reading that uh, Retail, were, retail and shopping centres were enjoying a 600% or a 1000% increase in footfall were April to April. Well, it's unsurprising, bear in mind the shopping centres were actually closed uh, last April. So uh, yes, statistics can, uh, can be worked in many different ways. Uh, well, I did say that the Chamber of Commerce and our partners uh, uh, are here to inform and to support. And Alison's put something in the chat there about uh, applying for an SME Brexit support fund. Uh, where small businesses can um, get up to £2,000 to pay for practical support, including training or professional advice to adjust to new customs rules of origin and VAT rules. And the link is in there for anybody that wants to, to have a look at that. So, Alison, thank you very much for popping that in there. Uh, that is very, very useful. Um, any other observations, ladies and gentlemen? No, I'm looking around the room. We're in. I've got one screen now, so I'm pretty. Um, well, 
in order to give you perhaps five minutes before your next meeting in this uh, in this virtual world that we live in, uh, I would just like to take this opportunity to uh, say a massive thank you to uh, to Judy and to the team at the LEP for your support and for your contributions. Uh, I know Gary's been on this call, in the fact I can see Gary there. So Gary, thank you to you and your team as well. Um, obviously, again to Arjun and to Lisa for creating this report, which is now available. Uh, we will uh, be sending a copy out to the attendees this afternoon, but it is available on our website right now and uh, will obviously be on our LinkedIn channels. So please keep looking at our social media, keep looking at the website, following the newsletters that you receive. And uh, one of the things that I would also like you to have a, a very close look at is, um, is the fact that our, uh, our awards are live and you are able to uh, apply for those now. And it's a fantastic opportunity to recognize some of the work that's been taking place uh, during lockdown and now as we emerge from lockdown. So please have a look on our website and follow our LinkedIn with regards to that. Uh, and finally, a great big thank you to you to, uh, for attending. Uh, thank you to those people who have uh, made contributions and have put comments in. And thank you for coming along and uh, making this event worthwhile, uh, informative, and hopefully something that you found that you've learned something from. So you've got four minutes to get the kettle on and we'll see you very, very soon. Take care, everyone. Bye-bye now.